people who aren't LGBT can quite imagine what it feels like to hear the lyrics of old Nassau and feel both inside and outside of the university's anthem. Can they imagine how it feels to hear, tune every heart and every voice, bid every care withdraw, sung at alumni day or after a basketball game, and want to tune your heart to the song's invitation to community? but to wonder whether your voice is part of the every to which it gestures. Living an invisible subcultural life in a school like Princeton, which takes such pride in its traditions of belonging, is heartbreaking to contemplate, and to many LGBT alumni, painful to remember. A recurring theme is the sense of isolation, that you were the only one in the world. We separated our work life from our personal life, and as long as we did that, the secret was safe. Being in my early 20s then, I just was like, okay, how do I answer this? Am I a lesbian? I used to go to the university bookstore uh, and flip through abnormal psychology books to try to identify something that looked like how I felt. I thought, well, gee, if I have a chance of being straight, it's probably going to be at Princeton. I can only point to one member of my class who I knew at the time I was an undergraduate who was out as an LGBT student. It was very much of a kind of secret society almost. When it comes to, to, to writing a history or, or researching history for a group which may have, may, in a lot of people's minds, be an invisible group, I think it is a challenge. When I entered in 1959, we were 10 years from Stonewall. Uh, Nobody I knew, either there or any place else for that matter, was openly gay, man or woman. I've never heard of another trans per person there. There has to be, statistically, and, and I used to like to think I was the first woman to graduate from Princeton, <laughs> but I don't really believe that. I mean, it was, the university in those days is a couple hundred years old, and there has to have been, even if nobody knew what transsexualism is. In certain ways there was nothing easier about sexuality than there was about classical Chinese. Um, and uh, both were dispatched, I'm happy to say, um, in an environment that let that happen. But it certainly wasn't a walk in the park. For being at Princeton in those days when there was so much activism, there was also so much homophobia. So I think there was, uh, you know, not just for me, I'm sure every Everyone who might have come out or might have been questioning at that time was also subject to the same homophobia that was there. One of my classmates was the head of the Gay Alliance of Princeton um, during our time there. On his freshman year dormitory, he hung out a banner um, for the Gay Alliance of Princeton. So if anybody was walking across near Wilson College, there was no way that you could miss this huge Gay Alliance of Princeton orange and black banner. Um, early in the second semester, uh, the room was vandalized. Um, so people broke into the room, vandalized the room, took the banner and tore the banner. Uh, I mean, just tore it to shreds. Uh, there was a full investigation, you know, any, any of the students that were found who broke into the room were suspended. You know, so there was reaction, you know, from the university that, you know, this kind of action will not be tolerated by the university. We will not tolerate vandalism. We will not tolerate any going into anybody's room and we will not tolerate um, any prejudice against any of our student body. I'm Sue Ann Steffi Morrow, and I became Associate Dean of the Chapel and Religious Life. I think for some of us it's hard to imagine, but maybe not for others of us, is how deeply closeted the students were at Princeton. Thinking back on it, I don't think the, the world at Princeton back in the late 70s and early 80s was, was much different than the world at large. I mean, there weren't a lot of people that were out at that point in time anywhere. I came to Princeton in 1980, and that was a time when the campus was really just starting to embrace the ideas of difference and diversity. It was a new paradigm. We wanted to reach out to the gay students, but where were they? Um, and uh, when I came in the fall of 81, I talked, I asked, I asked around, and, and it took me time to discover that, in fact, there was a small group that met in the dark back corner of the Murray Dodge Cafe. The first meeting I went to, there may have been four or five undergraduate men there. The lesbians 
met in the Women's Center, which was in Ehrenberg Hall on the second floor. I was very involved in the Women's Center was when I was at Princeton, so there was certainly a community around that. The role models there were, you know, a handful of students who were brave enough to be out and outspoken and, um, you know, known. And one professor who was openly gay, Michael Cadden, was, you know, definitely somebody I looked up to. I'm Karen Krahulik, class of 1991. I wrote my senior thesis on gay and lesbian marriages, which, God, you know, I don't even know how I knew about them, but, but I knew that they existed. I loved doing this work. I loved going out there, finding people who had been married, finding the ministers who had performed the marriages, investigating the legal aspects, the historical aspects. I officiated at the first gay marriage in the university chapel. When I was at Princeton, and because we were such a small community, we really wanted to be noticed on campus. We wanted the issue of closeted students and support for out students to be something that the campus was thinking about and that the administration was concerned about. Um, and we used to have um, events throughout the course of the year in order to to make that happen. Um, Gay Jeans Day was one of them and you know the message was simple if you support the LGBT community um, wear jeans. On a college campus where most people wear jeans that was a tough message to sell. We used to have um, a Gay Jeans Day rally um, right outside the chapel and people would be furious with us. They'd say why are you how can you put a message on something I wear every single day? For us, it was the conversation that it was starting. Over time, building upon those kind of quiet conversations, um, when the LGBT Center came, came along and the strength of Debbie Bazarski and the folks in her office really created a climate where it was much safer and where LGBT students across campus were welcomed. how happy I am at this moment. Um, this is really a, a dream come true to have this center here in the Frisk Campus Center, but more importantly, to have so many people here celebrating that we have such a center. I think all of you know that none of this, and I mean none of this, would have happened without Debbie Bazarski. When I first arrived at Princeton in 2001, um, there were very few out students on campus. I could actually name and count the number of students on my hands. I mean, there were very few students in general that were out. And a number of the students I met chose to come to Princeton because they thought it would make them stay in the closet. They could have gone to more liberal or open institutions, but they thought that Princeton would keep them closeted. You know, I feel like we've come from that place to the place where we are today, where we have 50 or 60 out students coming to campus already out every year and we have a really vibrant community on campus. We should have a space like that but we also shouldn't take it for granted because there are many other colleges that don't have it. Um, we're one of the few that has that and has a lot of programming come out of it you know every year. It's incredible to think that like in 1972 like someone releases an ad in the prints about Closet Queens Unite um, <laughs> and it's come to becoming an entire center um, and I really feel indebted um, to so many people because of my very very positive experience that I've had in the latter part of my Princeton career here um, and particularly to um, President Tillman who is the reason why we have a center in the first place. For me what was really terrific about Princeton is that um, it felt like this inclusive and 
supportive place from the day I arrived. I had the opportunity to serve as a trustee uh, with both Harold Shapiro as president and Shirley Tillman. And I think both Harold and Shirley um, contributed in enormous ways to making Princeton the place that it is today, making sure that all alumni felt welcome there. What has Shirley Tillman done for the gay and lesbian community? What has she done for the gay and lesbian community? I suppose just about as much as one single individual can do for a community. This is, I think, one of the most dramatic cultural changes that I've ever experienced in my life, which is the change in, in people's attitudes uh, toward LGBT uh, individuals. Um, so I think Princeton has benefited from that. But I think it is also uh, attributed to the fact that we now have three members of our cabinet who are openly gay and have, I think, um, signaled uh, to the rest of the university community um, that this is a place where uh, LGBT individuals can really thrive. <laughs>